Good afternoon. Hey guys, we're we back. made it. We're back finally. <laughs> so we're doing this. Um, somebody asked me today why we're putting our dirty laundry out there. <clears throat> and we're basically doing this because we went through some stuff and as we were looking for resources to help us, we found very little and none from personal experience. Everything was from a professional standpoint and <clears throat> It was not so helpful. It gave us good pointers and and kind of set us on track, but we thought, how great would it be if you could actually hear from a couple who's been through it and made it on the other side? Yes, and, and so really, in the end of all of this, we were just trying to to be a resource, be a resource, help people um, from what we went through kind of grow uh, from that and hopefully if you're in this situation or you are something anywhere near this situation you'll you'll be able to look well, at maybe this you can or, see the red flags or see the red flags or, or whatever we can do to help you get maybe to the other side like we did uh, disclaimer real quick we are not professionals we are not we're nobody kind of, we're, nobody's. we're just, a we're just couple. a just a married couple that went through some crap we love each other we're happy now and we want to help people be the same way so we're not trying to do telenovela. We're not doing airing out this stuff because it's it's something we want to air out just for funsies uh, or to see if we can be part of some sort of drama. We just want to air it out uh, so maybe we can help people when it comes to their relationship. And for that, it requires transparency and open and honest communication, which <clears throat> we've been talking about every episode. So we'll start with. Uh, so we ended last week. Max was born, and there was some PTSD from Raquel. Um, she kind of worked that out with her. She was able, luckily, to talk to her ex-husband, uh, and they kind of worked out some of their issues as well, and she was able to kind of uh, work on her postpartum anger. Well, kind of. Kind of. And then, after Max was born, I did find myself extremely angry. I actually didn't know that postpartum anger was a thing, until long after I was out of it. Um, I had Nobody ever mentioned postpartum anger. I mean, you've heard of postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, uh, not postpartum anger. So I just felt really angry at him for what seemed like no reason, because I could hear him breathing. That would anger me. Um, the fact that I could look over when I was up in the middle of the night and he was sleeping, that would anger me. I mean, it's just like everything. everything, everything and anything just would rage is really the word because it was something that I just felt like, who is this woman? And she's a bitch. Yeah. Like, stop. Whatever you're doing, just stop. So I was really like unhappy with myself and my emotions and having, feeling like I had no control over them. Um... And that kind of really started rocking the boat for us because I was mean. I would make comments and um, at first he took it really well. He kind of knew like, hey, hormones are crazy. I at least was advised that hormones could be crazy postpartum. But eventually he started snapping back at me, which would then piss me off more. I was like, in my mind, I was like, he doesn't even love me. Um, <laughs> But I was being unreasonable. I was and, definitely experiencing and, like an out of body experience. And, and then on top of that, we had co sleeping struggles that we had, you know, with the newborn. Obviously, we couldn't you, do the cuddle thing. We couldn't do the cuddle thing, and, and that's something we had done before. Um, so obviously, anyone out there that's had a child and, and knows that newborns, you know, have a couple hours and they get up, they want to breastfeed or bottle of your. I mean, we tried thing. to put the crib next to the we bed. Try and put the crib. But next every time the getting him out of the crib. Um, we ended up just putting him between us in the bed. So it, it, it added to uh, a farthering, a distancing even farther with the inability to uh, have, you know, so love languages. You know, we talk about love languages all the time. You know, I know Raquel's is acts of service and she knows mine is <laughs> physical touch. Physical touch. She's on the spot. I mean, look, she's in her nothing box. Look, she was talking crap about my nothing box last week, and now she's Sorry, here. Sorry, this, this particular episode has me a little... Frazzled. <clears throat> yes. So, 
Love language miscommunication. So I wasn't getting a physical touch. Love language. But at that point, we didn't even really realize what our love languages were. Very um, true. He would he would make me breakfast, and I was I would have said I would have said appreciative of it. But I was like, yeah, you better make me breakfast because I've been up all night with this baby. Mm-hmm. So my attitude was funk. And I kind of had no idea at that point that his love language was physical touch. So after Max was born and um, he had no way of expressing that to me because he didn't even know that his love language was physical touch at that time. This is a realization we made way later. Way later. Way later. Way later. So um, we'll fast forward. Okay. We left Puerto Rico at that time, just in time we missed the hurricane. Barely. Um, We made it to El Paso. We stayed in a temporary housing for a while until all our furniture got here months later. And then we moved to uh, a house and got, as soon as we got that set up, I was already deploying. I was already headed to As soon as we got here, we already knew that he was deploying and I was like, oh, that's great. We just spent like four months apart and now we get him back and now we know he's leaving already. And the distance didn't help. And so distance Because initially you were leaving in October yeah. and it was literally, he got back uh, in September. Yeah. Beginning of September and the, all of a sudden he's like, the oh, only, by the way, he's deploying in October. The only thing that saved me was the fact that our household goods wasn't here and nothing was set up and, you know, I didn't want to leave Raquel like that. Um, and luckily my unit was understanding in that fact uh, that I just come from Puerto Rico where they got hit with like hurricane season hard. So, um, you know, they were understanding, so... Thankfully, he didn't have to deploy until about January. Yeah. In which time, we were pregnant with Theo. By the time he deployed, we just... I mean, like eight I, hours prior. Like, I just I had just arrived in, in Kuwait overseas, and I got a call. I sent him the confirmation. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah. By the way, we are pregnant again. So, I mean... The deployment was really rough for me because I felt like we didn't get enough time together before he had to leave again. Even though... We got a few extra months. It wasn't like, oh, we know that instead of October, he's going to leave in January. It was kind of a thing where every week or every two weeks, it would be like, no, okay, you'll leave in November. Oh, okay, you'll leave at the end of November. Oh, you'll leave in December. And it was always like, we're playing the waiting game. It was always looming. Looming over us, like Mm -hmm. causing stress. And we're like, can we enjoy, can we plan anything for any holiday? Because we don't know if you'll be here. So the pre-deployment was stressful. And then when he deployed, I like genuinely felt alone. We had just gotten back to El Paso. I didn't have friends here yet. Yeah, we didn't have a, any circle. It was a rough situation because the friends we had had in El Paso were gone. She was left alone uh, with four kids and pregnant. And I know that he didn't want to be gone, but that didn't change the fact that I resented the fact that he was gone. That's Which, the beauty and, of emotions. You and, really, I mean, logic. Does and, not care. And, and like we talked about in the last episode, you know, with these little resentments that you build, they build onto a culture or an idea or a pattern. A pattern where you, you, you know, you resenting this person is just a pattern for you. And then it just builds and builds and builds until you have contempt. And when you're at the contempt stage, that's when you get dangerous. Because once you get to contempt rising, it turns from resentment to contempt. And then that's a situation where no matter what the person does, even if they're doing something good for you or nice for you or whatever the situation you're is. You're critical of it. You're very critical. And you you don't ever see, even you know making a breakfast or, 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 or doing some sort of active service or being all at home with the kids all day or, or whatever, it's always seen as a negative because that's how you perceive it. That's how you see it. And once that contempt gets there, it's, it's just going to stay there until you either get rid of it by communicating or you separate and you years later yeah, you decide too Let's much let's just say you... this contempt leads to divorce that yes. is a hundred percent of the time if you feel some level of contempt towards your spouse those are the biggest red flags you're going to get you're heading to divorce mm-hmm. um <clears throat> after he got back from deployment i was about a month away from giving birth so we had very little reintegration time to get back into the swing of things, of co-parenting. Um, I felt like, look, I've been doing it's this. Very rushed. I've been doing this without you for this time, so just let me handle it. Mm. Um, he obviously, as the father figure, wanted to be um, a help. You know, I wanted to do something. I wanted to feel like I was, you know, going to help her with the pregnancy because I, I felt like I helped more with Max's pregnancy. 
Because you were around. Because I was around. And then with Theo's, it, it was difficult because I came right at the end. She was in the late third, trim- third trimester, and uh, it was just difficult. It was difficult all around because, you know, at that point, contempt had been rising for months and unchecked contempt because I wasn't even present to be there to try and do anything. So then contempt turns into what we're calling anger vomiting, which is something we've heard from other podcasts, uh, anger vomiting and walking away where you just spew all these angry things on each other. and Without just... any concern of how the other person is receiving it, how hurtful it is towards them, you're just saying what you think and feel. No holds bar, right? Yep, no holds bar. And then you just walk away. And then what the problem with You don't with actually is, work through it. The problem with it is you don't work through it. You, you, you anger vomit. You just say whatever the heck's on your mind. You anger vomit. And then you just say, okay, well, I, at least I got it out. And, you know, whether or not it hurt her feelings or whether or not it hurt his feelings, you know, psh, who cares? You know, I, I said it. I'm good. And then the the other problem on top of anger vomiting and walking away is that it was a pin that was always pushed in and never going to get pulled because it, it becomes something that you don't want to talk about. You you let it out and... And you know what you said was harsh. Yeah. So you don't even want to touch on it again. So <laughs> you just... You know you're about you to open ign- a can of worms. You just ignore it. So, um, you just kind of set it aside. Um, so obviously that led to... Not being on the same page when it came to parenting. Yeah, um, there's a lot of parenting. Not being on the same page with our relationship. Yeah, relationship and parenting struggles quickly follow when you're doing stuff like that. When you're anger vomiting and, and you're... Now, everything he did as a parent was wrong. Mm-hmm. And I had some critique of it. Mm-hmm. And he did not appreciate any one of those critiques. It I wasn't in would the headspace. So kind of like of a us, blow up fight. Not, neither of us again were in the headspace because we were already in the headspace of resentment towards contempt. And then when you get to contempt, everything you see is negative. So even if they're saying something nice, it's still like, well, they don't really mean that because they really mean this. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's just negative, negative, negative. So then we try to do. We get to. The title wave portion. Yeah, the title of wave portion. This episode. Um, we attempted because this one over here is always listening to podcasts and trying to read books or listen to books on, on audible and stuff. I'm always looking up articles, trying to research things. Um, and so we, I found this podcast that was, uh, was it the four horsemen of the apocalypse yeah. of marriage? This is basically, like if, like if these are things that are happening, you're getting divorced. If these four things are occurring in your marriage you are going to get divorced with like an over 90 percent certainty okay so as we're listening to the podcast i'm over here taking notes and going like "Ooh, that's not good Ooh, that's and he was kind of listening half listening Mm -hmm. um and then we paused it and we decided to try some of the tips and pointers that they gave about communication Mm -hmm. failed miserably epic fail phrase like we fall. had such a struggle with doing the I statements and not saying because you, <laughs> you know how hard that is. Like I felt disappointed because the actions. <laughs> it was that difficult happened. because of the place we were at with our with each other in our relationship was it was just a bad place to even start that. Um, it was it, it, all this contempt and and all these things, these grudges and these resentments that we had held for all this time without them being said and without you cleaning out that closet and, and kind of cleaning up, you know, old resentments and forgiving each other, you can't start from that spot. We tried to start from the middle and not the beginning. The beginning is, is you communicate with one another and say, okay, I... Air we try to tackle the now problems, instead of which, the- which brought, when you jump to the right now problems, you kind of uh, bring in all your old baggage into this one problem and you bombard them with a ton of crap yeah. where you should be focusing on this one problem. You're like, well, I have a problem with this because two years ago you did this and the year before that you did this and, and it's just piling stuff on top of stuff. So we kind of went about it the wrong way initially. It failed epically. Um, we Facebook even tried to request, there's a, a some advice that we got that it said, if you ever feel overwhelmed with emotions in the middle of a conversation, heated debate or whatever with your spouse, ask for a break um some families are taught to just hash it out and keep talking until you get to the bottom of it 
But when you are in a heightened emotional state and you feel like you're going to say something hurtful, you're no longer thinking just logically, you're thinking emotionally, uh, you need to ask for a break. Yep. And at that point, I asked for a break. And I didn't give it to him because <laughs> okay. cause that was in my headspace. I was I, like, I need a fault, break. <laughs> it did not happen. Um, and the third time I requested a break, like back to back, he's like, okay, but one more thing. And I blew up. I literally exploded. My mouth said everything mean, everything. And I flat out told him I want a divorce. Mm -hmm. I'm done with this. There is no hope for us. We failed this four, four horsemen of the apocalypse test. Four horsemen just ran us we over. We just checked them all <laughs> off. Four horsemen there just ran no us over. There is no hope. We are done. And at that point, this was January of 2020. Yep, January of 2020. January of this year. So then we start preparing for he was retired yeah so preparing for my retirement had so we surgery. Kinda, we put we, things on the shelf so, we just so decided again, we're not so again we, we we say that and then we we put a pin in it indefinitely which is a horrible idea which is we're just, like we're just not going to talk about anything like, that upsets us because we can't handle it yep we can't do it without being so we're just going to pretend that everything's we're just, good just put it aside yeah. focus we'll on figure that out that's future kids. me's problem you yeah. know and uh, and then he had surgery, so I was tending to his needs then, trying to be caring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then after that, the pandemic hit. Yep. And it was kind of a blessing because we could easily put whatever was going on between us aside, easily. Um, because... We were super distracted, and with we everything. agreed. Yeah, with and, the world. and then we found we, that we agreed on things. Yeah, we agreed on the stuff with the pandemic, with the mask being dumb, and the, and the six feet of social distancing, and, and the and lockdowns, just, and the and all lockdown, that. and all that stuff. So we we agreed on that. So we we took solace in the fact that we agreed on that, and we decided that we would circle. And the pandemic just circled everything. Our conversations at that point were something related to the pandemic, uh, something related to politics, and the weather, just. Mundane, the kids, the kids, just mundane everyday stuff that you know, without actually talking. But we to one still another. we talked a lot, but it was just it was failing. surface arguments yeah. or conversations, nothing about what we were actually feeling or thinking on anything to do with us as a couple, mm -hmm. as a relationship. Um, out of the pandemic, we started EP Freedom Schoolers. Which was another great, absolutely wonderful distraction. Also gave, doing some good in our community, but it gave us a distraction to plan things and to get out of the house and be apart from each other. Have events to go have to. Have events to go to and be not in the house near each other or around each other. I mean, not. I mean, obviously we would go together, so we still. But we would stand over here and over there. Yeah, yeah. We, we weren't like socialize. Yeah, you know, we would with socialize other. with other people. That way, we wouldn't have to be around each other. We'd be less time staring at one another. So by that point, we had been doing that for a few months, and there was a complete communication breakdown. We had, we knew there were issues, we did not talk about them, mm -hmm. and we refused to talk about mm -hmm. them because we knew that it would end up in a fight that neither of us could handle. And we obviously weren't dating each other, partly because of the pandemic, because well, things were closed. Things but were the closed, other and, is, and, and you know, this is the funny to. thing is that, the funny thing is, is that we intentionally, we talked about this the other day, Raquel and I were talking about this extensively, like we intentionally did not date, like we could have gone on dates, like he just, you know, you know, married couples, he married with five kids. I mean, a date could be going to the store together, or going here together, or going there together, taking and, a walk. and taking a walk, you know, just, it doesn't have to be candlelight, you know, Everything we did was with the children. Everything we did was with the kids because we didn't intentionally do that because I we I think subconsciously we were both afraid if we got alone with each other we'd realize we had nothing to talk about. Yeah. Or or we'd have an argument and we didn't want to do that. So we we got to the point where we weren't even dating. We weren't even trying to even have alone time with one another other than to talk about pandemic or watch the news or you know whatever. So then we have the breaking point. I um, mentally decide to abandon ship. Yeah, she mentally decides to jump ship. I'm just going to wait until COVID is done. I'm going to wait until his retirement stuff is done. <clears throat> I'm going to not rock the boat until his boat is on, you know, calm waters. That was my plan. Um, and roll out. I was, yeah, <laughs> I was just waiting, waiting for the right time. Mm -hmm. But in that meantime, there were several times in which I said I want a divorce. Yes. Um, there was one time where he even looked up 
um, how divorce, much divorce, how much it would cost. And yeah. he's like, oh, what about this? And I was like, oh, that sounds good. But we were so nonchalant about it. We were talking about it like we were just talking about like, oh, do you want to buy this sweater or that one? Oh, yeah, that one. That one's, mm-hmm. that one's a good fit. Um, obviously, this is something that affected the communication in the bedroom. It being completely transparent, it felt like a chore. It felt like something I had to do. I was just not interested. Um, it did not feel like intimacy. It did not feel like connection. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was used anytime that did happen. Um, so I d- obviously did not want sex because who wants who wants that? Who wants to feel used and disconnected? It's yeah. just it was very hmm, no thanks. And at that point, we became roommates. It was basically roommate time. <clears throat> at that point, we were basically roommates uh, that every once in a while would hook up. <laughs> Because he wanted to, not because he wanted to. No, no, because of her. Um, uh, You guys probably know that sex for a woman is tied very much with her emotions. So if emotionally you are not feeling like your love tank is being filled, you are far less likely to want to be intimate with your spouse. So husbands, make sure that you are filling your wife's emotional tank. Find out what her love language is. There's tests that you can take with the love language. Just Google it. Free tests. Free little quiz that lets you know where you stand, what it is that you need, what your spouse needs, and then start communicating your love to each other based on your love languages. So at that point, we not only did we not want to spend time together, but we also like intentionally found excuses, especially me, to be out of the house, be out to, be of the able house to have something else to do, to have some. I, I didn't look for it, but I jumped at any chance I had to be out of the house, to be somewhere else. Event, to be with other people, anything, <clears throat> and then we get to dark the waters. dark waters, and this is the part where we're going to advise you to DM me or him at your own, at risk. Your own risk. Again, I want to reiterate what, what that I mean by everything that. that we're talking about. Here, we have extensively talked about. If you have questions um, or want some more clarification or something, feel free to DM us. But if uh, your intent is to cast judgment and uh, say, well, commiserate, (laughs) save it. Um, You're not going to get anywhere with that. We might even call you out. Um, So by that point, we already mentioned that I had mentally divorced my husband. Yes. Um, I was basically seeking connection elsewhere. Not physical connection. I was seeking friendship, uh, someone who had common interests with me to talk to, male, female, it didn't matter. Um, But in that, it led to me making the first move in the wrong direction. Yes. So I stepped outside of our marriage. In my mind, I was like, this isn't cheating because I don't want to be with him. And I've already told him numerous times that I don't want to be with him. So I saw that not going anywhere. And I figured like, maybe I'll make it very clear that I want a divorce and that I don't want to do this anymore and that I'm not happy. Because again, in all this time, it's not that I wasn't saying I'm not happy and this is why. It's that... It felt like it, I wasn't heard. Nothing ever changed, which is what led us to... I just stopped communicating it anymore. I stopped nagging him about stuff. Um, I stopped complimenting him. It was just... Lack of communication. Lack of completely. communication altogether. It was just a complete breakdown. So that kind of made it easy to connect with someone else. Yeah. Because, I mean, I we would sit and watch TV every night for hours. And not talk. And not talk. So, um, <clears throat> so yep, I did. It was me who had the affair, uh, but we don't call it that. We, it's called an RNV, which is a relationship norm violation. The, the, the problem with it is, is that the, this affair relationship norm violation that we call it, it happened at a very, the lowest point of our marriage and a low point in Raquel's life. Um, and she'll tell I you the same. I was depressed. I was actually struggling with depression at that point. <clears throat> I contacted a therapist. Of course, 
Therapy right now is really difficult to come by, especially if you didn't have an existing relationship with a therapist. It took several weeks to even get someone to talk to me and then it wasn't even a therapist, it was a psychiatrist. So what do psychiatrists do versus a therapist? They wanna throw medication at it. So he's like, oh, you're depressed? Here, take this medication. This is gonna help you. Um, every week, this psychiatrist had um, a different diagnosis for me. I kid you not, he went from bipolar having uh, inklings that I might be bipolar to inklings of me having relationship disorder, um, something attachment disorder attachment or something. Disorder. And I was like, mm, what? Every week it was something else. Like I was like, all right, so I'm a mental case then. Maybe that's why I had an affair because I'm just nuts. Nothing I do makes sense. Maybe I have multiple personalities too. Maybe that's why I could do that. I mean, it who was knows a lot. at this point? <laughs> it was a lot. Uh, <clears throat> it was a lot. And, and we, uh, you know, when I found out about it, because I found out it wasn't. He found out I two months later, yeah, by two the months, way. Two months later, I found out. It wasn't, it wasn't, I found out the right way. She didn't tell me. No one was up front with me. I found out on my own. Um, so obviously, you know, when, when you find out, you know, you have anger and resentment and, and everything going on. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, after I let all that out and realized that he, he yelled a lot, yeah, 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 I got upset. <laughs> um, he was very upset and I was a hundred percent understanding because here's the thing, guys, I mentioned before that my ex-husband cheated on me while I was pregnant. So I know what it feels like to be cheated on. I know how it feels and, like and, you lost your best friend. And, and, and just to rewind just a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, the night I find out, uh, she seemed very like done nonchalant, like. You know, I'm good. I'm glad you. Know. I had no response. I was and like, "It's reality, babe. It's what it is. It is what it is." So you're, you know, go. So obviously, his response was like, "What the?" Yeah. So I was like, "All right, well, I guess I'll leave." Uh, and then I, I decided to sleep on it, <clears throat> and I prayed about it. And then the next morning, when she woke up, she decided I did not want him to go, and I was surprised with myself. I was a little bit pissed with myself because I'm like, what girl, this is what you wanted, right? You wanted him to leave. You wanted the marriage to be over. And now you're like, no, I don't want him to leave. So it was very interesting to wake up and feel that even after, you know, all the yelling I received, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. Um, I know that choosing I for him to stay meant that I was going to get a lot more of that. Like there was going to be a lot more difficult conversations, difficult and negative interaction, and, and, and painful conversations. Painful conversations. So at that point, the easiest route for us would have been to just, just walk away, walk away, split it up. Um, and then I obviously decided to stay. I decided to stay the next morning. Uh, and then we started a very, very long, difficult, uh, process of rebuilding. Um, and Which started out with him asking, like the game, twenty questions, but it was a hundred questions. And it was poor. And it was questions. like a hundred questions that were absolutely, uh, what's the word, like revealing? Like it made me feel naked. Like I had no protection over myself. Like it was very vulnerable. It really was. Every question that he asked, just like, oh, I'm gonna answer this, and. I gotta tell you, I thought I was gonna die that week. I mm. cried so much. Um, my face was swollen for at least half the week. And he was so emotionally drained and spent. I would just lay um, down and sleep. Like I'd go upstairs and just lay down and sleep because I was just emotionally drained. Um, I, I, and at that point is when we realized, I think we started realizing right then that the issues that led us here was the communication and the being emotionally closed off. I, I, I think for me, I mean, on my side of it, uh, I think for me, it was realizing that there, you know, what she did was entirely 100% her. But what led to her getting there was not entirely her. That was 50%, at least 50% me. Um, you know, obviously, in a relationship, you're 50 50. So, you know, it was both of us, uh, in some points, more me than her. Uh, and at some points more her than me, uh, but getting her to that point to that low point in our marriage and that low point in 
um, in her life uh, was just, it wasn't just her. It, it wasn't just her that got it. What she did with it is obviously her own doing. And that's something that, you know, we've obviously discussed extensively and we've forgiven, I've forgiven her and she's what, accepted, the, accepted forgiveness. the forgiveness and trying to forgive herself uh, is what I'm going to go with because I don't, I, I hope she's forgiven I'm herself. I'm there. She's I there. told you I am there. She's am there. there. You make it easy to forgive myself. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, in the spirit of that, you know, we started working on everything else. I mean, cleaning out. I mean, after that happened, it was really like, what else? I mean, what else could you possibly say that's going to do something that's going to like hurt? Yeah, at that point, so I think at we that both point, felt it's like, like might as well just be honest. We have nothing to lose now because we're already on the cusp of just calling it and walking away from each other and figuring out everything. The one thing I want to say out loud and, and something I've, I've said to her numerous times is the one thing I'm very, very, very proud of is the fact that in the very beginnings of all of this, we, we, we said, okay, the kids have nothing to do with this. The kids have no play in this. There's no, no matter what happens between you and I, we will. I will always have a relationship with the kids, all five kids, and so and, we're not going to stay together. And, and we're not going to stay together for just the, the sake of the children. If we stay together, it's for each other. It's because we because want to. you and I want to be together, <clears throat> not because we don't want. And I got to be honest with y'all, like, and you know this already. In those first couple weeks, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure that that that's what I wanted. Um, Maybe every every day, mm -hmm. every conversation was like, is this going to be the one where we're like, yo, I'm just done with, with this. It. This is yeah. too much. We screwed the pooch and we're just going to move on and be good co-parents. Yeah, be the good, end. go live near each other, be good, good co-parents. The kids will have a place, another place to go to, uh, you know, mom's house, dad's house, bounce between, whatever. I mean, and the fear yeah. of not knowing, I mean, because we knew like, okay, so we're going to stay together. Well... We know we have a lot to talk about, a lot to work through, and then rebuilding trust. I mean, that mountain seems so high. Like, how do you mm -hmm. rebuild trust after something like this? Like, what are the steps? Yeah. Um, researching the heck out of everything. Yeah, I, I, I probably read too many articles to count. Over, and I kept thinking, over 50 I kept articles thinking like, I'm not going to like this. And, and all this stuff. I'm not going to like the and, road to <clears> recovery. Because everything sounded like work. Because, it, it, because of the mindset we were still in. But when we aired out everything and decided to start forgiving each other for these little grievances, the resentments that had built up over the years, and then into the big resentments and the big grievances that we had with one another, we found that with every forgiveness, it was easier for the next one. Mm -hmm. And with with every uh, every time that we aired something out, and had to be vulnerable with one another and be emotional and, 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 and speak what we wanted and our feelings and our needs. And we our, were reconnecting. And we were reconnecting. <laughs> in those very moments. In those very moments we didn't realize, but we were reconnecting as a, as a couple and as, a, as two people that loved one another and, and realizing. Guys, I went from feeling like I didn't love him. I couldn't stand him. I thought he was a jerk. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden I'm like, no, but I don't want you to go. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Why? Don't ask me because I don't have the answers. Um, but here I am. Let's see if we can make this happen. I think we were both very skeptical that it would even get to this point. I mean, where we're at now, we're still surprised by the level of communication where we're at now. Um, how on the same page we are, how happy we feel, feeling like we actually love each other yeah. again. Um Wanting that to spend time together, wanting to be around each other, wanting to date. The cuddle is the back. The cuddle is back. Uh, you know, all these things. Oh, see, and now, funny story. That's not so funny. I was struggling with sleep. Aside from, obviously, waking up in the middle of the night to nurse. Um, even, we'd go to bed at, what, 2, 3 in the morning? Like, we just couldn't even fall asleep. Before all this, we were just at that place, like, we'd stay up a ridiculous uh, amount ridiculous of hours time. doing nothing, wasting time, not even connecting with each other. Mm. And um, after all this started, we started actually cuddling again to go to bed. And all of a sudden, we're sleeping. Like, we're sleeping. I used to have trouble sleeping. Melatonin didn't work. Magnesium didn't work. Nothing. I mean, nothing worked. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, that's so weird. Don't 
don't tell the government, but his sleep apnea machine, useless now. He doesn't need it. He doesn't even snore anymore. I don't know what magic happened Man, there, I don't but know. thank God because his snoring was brutal. It sounded like a truck. I got tons of recordings in my contempt years. Disclaimer, <laughs> clinically I am still sleep <laughs> He still needs it, okay? <laughs> I still need it. Secret. Um, uh, but yeah, so it, it you know it's it's not an easy road, and, and and it's not something that I would say try out. Don't go that route. Don't Look, go that route. If you can prevent having an affair, uh, well, is it uh, Kevin Fredericks and his wife Melissa? They have a Love Hour podcast that we listen to on occasion. His joke was like um, how to have an affair and have a better a better marriage for it or something, and we we're like, wow, that's pretty sick. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's kind that's, of that's what has kind of what happened, happened here. for us. Still don't recommend it. Don't recommend it. It's not don't go that there. route. No. Don't go that route. It's not recommended. It's very, <laughs> I don't recommend doing it's that. It's challenging, but at the end of the day, it's just amazing to both of us on how just doing the right things, even when you don't fully believe or trust that this is going to work. If you're actually doing those things, like trying to communicate, be considerate of the other when you are communicating making an effort to listen to understand your partner compassion having compassion and, for and, each other and, it and works. working on compromise and then understanding that communication is built in two pieces one is communication and the other half is listening mm -hmm. if you're listening and then not just waiting for your turn to talk if you're listening to someone and then you're you're trying to communicate with them back and you're working on this it will work you're part i have of a this. question for you um as a man do you feel like it was Difficult for you to forgive me for having an affair? Is that something that you I don't ever think, saw? I don't think gender has anything to do with the difficulty level of Except forgiving Except men someone. tend to be more egotistical. You know? That's true. I, I, I guess I guess you could say, I mean, I, I guess it was harder. It took a little bit longer for me to come to grips with it. Um, especially because the level of trust I had for you at that time, you know, was like, you know, she would never do this to me. Um, but... I don't think that male or female, I think coming to grips with the fact that, you know, your your significant other or, or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, but the research pretty much says that, you know, when men get cheated on. And you literally bye. bounce down, I'm done. Bye, chick. I, and I, women tend to be I, more I, forgiving. I, and I, I think my, my faith in the Lord, I think, I, I mean, obviously in all of you are Christian, you don't have to be. If you don't want, I would recommend it because I am one. But uh, I think, you know, I prayed about a lot of things, uh, you know, which we'll get into in the next episode with because uh, we're going to next episode is going to be the difficult conversations and going through those, which is going to be another interesting one. Um, but I, I prayed a lot uh, and asked God, you know, for his direction in my life uh, and what his will would be. And if this is his will for me to to be here and to stay, then he will put it in my heart to stay. And I stayed, you know, and I, and I think I look at it as, you know, in my opinion, I look at it as divine intervention because I mean, the, if you had seen the night before I was ready to go and she was just like, whatever, don't care. Bye. Uh, bye. And the next morning it was a, it was a whole different story. You know, it was just a completely different story. Uh, with I would say it was divine intervention because I eventually went to sleep that night we weren't even done. We just said we're tired. We're like, we're tired. Uh, tired. It's like 4 a.m. I'm Theo tired. Theo had woken sleep. up, yeah. so I went to go put him back down, and I just never came down. Mm -hmm. And then um, he didn't sleep in the bed that night, and I woke up the next morning and was like, don't go. And she said she felt heart, her heart felt heavy. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Which was the first, because up until that point, I was like, whatever. I mentally divorced your ass a while ago. So, so yeah. So, I mean, I. I look at it as that, and I think it might be easier. Um, maybe for me, it was easier that way, you know, uh, praying about it and, and turning to God for 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 direction. And maybe that's why I had an, not easy. It's not easy. Oh, I, gotta I say easier something. time, but Let it's not easy. Let me tell you guys something. Um, in the eight years that we'd been together, he had never cried once. Not a single tear, not even watery eyes. There was like Step a toe. zero. <laughs> there was like zero emotion um, that was vulnerable that he would show me. Um, the emotions I would often see are anger, frustration, um, 
And which when is he was just happy, surface, you know, and when he was happy, it, it was but there surface, was no yeah. other emotions in between that were ever something that he shared with me. It was something that he kept bottled down. And year after year, I would kind of make the joke like, someday you're going to have to open up to me. Someday you're going to have to, you know, show me you have emotions for this to work or I'm out. So yeah. in, even subconsciously, I had like a time clock of how long am I going to put up with feeling like I'm emotionally in this relationship alone before I roll out. <clears throat> and there was times in our, in that first conversation, I was like, you wait until I'm done. <laughs> so all of a sudden say, oh, hey, I'm here. I'm open. I have emotions too. And it was beautiful. It felt very intimate. And at the same time, frustrating. Cause I'm like, we could have been doing this <laughs> the whole time, you know, for <laughs> so long. We would have never been here. Um, it, it took a jolt. You know, to get me there, I, I must admit. I threw a bomb. I, threw, I had to. Yeah. It apparently, it required a bomb because I, I literally tried. Tried to burn the whole thing else. down just to see what would happen, and, and we found out. So, it, it's difficult. Uh, you know, it, it, there's, there's, like I said, next episode we're going to talk a lot about the difficult conversations we had post uh, finding out about the affair. Um, and the you know, R&B the R&B relationship norm violation. violation we had to basically pull the boat out of the, the water and just tear it dry completely dock down dry dock it and just completely tear the whole thing apart uh, and get down to uh, issues that we had let fester uh, things that we had kept to ourselves um, and not saying anything and trying to be you know happy through so it it's, smile through I, it I smile through the pain kind of thing um, as the woman who had the affair which is not the typical huge, the norm um i didn't set out looking for someone else because hell no that was just not my intent um i just wanted out of this relationship i did not want into a new relationship mm -hmm. that wasn't the goal uh, i was looking for that connection conversation Having topics to talk about, think, things that we agreed so, on. So basically, like like we had talked, we we talked about in the first few weeks. You know, Raquel kind of realized that you know she was superimposing. Um, what I was lacking. What it was lacking our from our relationship. Uh, you know, onto someone else. Onto someone else, and trying to make a square peg fit a round hole uh, kind of situation, just because you know she was lacking it at home, so she was getting her emotional tank filled somewhere else um and even when that was happening i in those moments i was not thinking for a second that this was going to lead to something else mm. it was just a friendship mm. um and then it did so beware of when you appear to be seeking connection outside of your marriage yes you should have friends outside of your marriage you yes. should have Absolutely. Yes, friends you of your own, friends that you have together. You share, things like but that. But when you realize, for example, I'll give you a little example. If you feel comfortable going to a friend and complaining about your spouse, red flag. Mm. Huge red flag. Because when you say stuff like, oh, well, I was, I, my husband's always doing this and I tell him and then he just keeps doing it. Anytime you talk, when you get to that point, you have a spouse. communication breakdown. Yeah. You, there's no world in which you are effectively communicating, and you. I say something to my spouse, and my spouse ignores me, doesn't hear me, or keeps doing what he was doing. If you're effectively communicating, that's speaking and listening, saying it with compassion, and interested in making your relationship work. You shouldn't be in that situation. So again, if you feel like you're in a situation in which you find it easy to talk to a friend, a close friend about stuff your husband's doing that's not right, that hurts your feelings, how he's not listening to you, red flag, open yeah. your eyes because your relationship is heading down a track where it could end. Yeah. If you don't course correct. It's, it, again, you know, it, it, like I said, you know, Understanding that getting to the where she was in her life uh, and in our marriage to get to that point, you know, understanding that was my fault as well. <clears throat> it also helps, 
you know, with the forgiveness part and with trying to understand, you know, trying to come to this with the fact that I love her, I respect her, and I, I'm trying to understand her position and, and her, her thoughts and what she was doing or what she's thinking. So understanding that is, and the, other is thing, the beginning of the, other thing of the conversations we, you're going to have to have to to get to a better place. The other thing that we should, I would like to say, is that when you hear about an affair that happens in a marriage or a relationship, um, you hear about how difficult it is to rebuild trust. It's what not. a long, hard journey it is. But reality is that trust is a choice and it requires faith. Mm. So you can regain trust in your relationship in a week, in two weeks, in two months, it, in five years. It just depends it, on what you're willing to do and give to your spouse in that moment mm -hmm. how much grace you're willing to give how much trust you're willing to give um it's kind of like an oxymoron like how much trust you're willing to give determines how much trust you'll have and how quickly it, that'll happen it is obviously you know coming from the point of the person that was r and uh it's not easy you know obviously but again you know, once you choose, I mean, because choice, you make the, again, with choice is to forgive. Uh, if you decide to forgive them. You, you, and when, forgiveness is also a choice, if, not if you, a feeling. Yeah, it's not a feeling. If you're waiting to feel it, then it's going to be a hot minute. It's going to be a long time. So, you know, you forgive them <clears throat> and you truly say, I forgive you. And you, you work on that forgiveness. Trusting them again is part of that. So there was never a point uh, in this that I was like, oh, you know, I want to see your phone. your phone. Let me check your phone. Let me do this. Let me do that. Uh, I never Give had me any access to your account. Yeah, I've never yeah. had any. I've never had access to any. I mean, I don't have any access now. I've, I've whatever. Uh, I barely know how to work my phone. So, uh, <clears throat> um, so I, I, I think you know, once you choose to forgive, it's easier to choose to trust again, and then understanding in, in my portion of it of this this whole thing. <clears throat> is understanding that, you know, holding on to that anger and holding on to that frustration and holding on to that hurt, it doesn't go anywhere positive. And you can you can hang on to it and be super negative and just turn into this black hole of a person and let it eat away at you, first off, and then let it eat away at your relationship with your significant other and then end your marriage anyway. Uh, even if you say, okay, I forgive you, let's stay together. And you're like, okay, but then it's just one you know, set up after the next. Once you forgive somebody, it's not ammunition to use it again over and over and over to beat them over the head with it. You want to bash them over the head with, with what happened. Um, because that doesn't lead you to a conversation that, that resolves anything. And then all you are left with is anger, resentment, and 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 just, you know, nothing good. It's and just why all would you want black. to stay in a relationship? It's all just blackness on your soul. And, and I decided in that moment that that's not something for me. I decided that it, I didn't want to be angry. I didn't want to be just let it eat away at me and ruin my relationship, not one with her, but also with the kids. Because, you know, if you're just walking around frustrated and angry all the time, it's going to affect your children as well. Um, so I didn't want that for them. And, uh, you know, I decided to forgive and then work on truly forgiving and then work on truly understanding how we got where we were and how to get us out of it. And then when you get to that point, all these things that you talk about and you, you let all it go of all that resentment and all that 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 anger contempt. and contempt and you just let it go, it feels like a weight off of you. And then once that weight is off of you and you're able to breathe again, um, you know, you start getting to a spot where you can talk honestly and openly with one another and say, okay, this is what led me here this is what led me there this is where i'm at this is what i'm thinking and, and you know raquel and i have said numerous times that open communication open and honest communication with one another smooths so many things over because you, when you know someone's heart you know someone's intention and you know what they're thinking and what they're doing and how they feel there's no question in your mind about what they're doing so that again builds to trust so you know and now we're here. And now we're here. About two and a half months later. Two and a half months later from that day. And it, so we, we're going to kind of wrap it up with this episode here. Mm -hmm. uh, and next week, we're going to talk about, um, you know, the way back. You know, the, 
that that's pretty much the big bulk of how we dry docked how, how we how we got to the spot where we're like okay we are what level of conversation and transparency we had to have with each other to get here mm -hmm. so a fresh, it, new a fresh new relationship and we're starting all over again well some of you are going to watch this and be like you know I'm in a relationship. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I wouldn't want to do that. Um, but I, what I can tell you from my experience is, is what do you got to lose? If you're in a relationship right now that you feel like, you know, I can't do that because I don't want to, yeah, this is too much work. I, I don't feel like doing it. If you're already in that mindset where it's like contempt and, and you're, you're thinking about divorce, or you're thinking about not being together. What's the worst of going out with a bang? Going out with at least being honest and being truthful and, and saying everything you had to say and, and feel. Again, always and, with compassion. And with yourself. compassion, obviously. You know, and, and in the beginnings, and like like I said, next week, uh, episode will be Iceberg. And we talk about painful realizations and the conversations we had in, in the first few weeks and all that. And, and we're going to get to, you know, getting past. And, and putting up our... A smiley face when we were around other people. Mm, because, which was difficult. You know, which is difficult. Which is kind of what led us to realize that, like, man, people be going through stuff and not sharing it with anyone. Yeah. Like, you know, couples. I wonder so, how many other couples have gone through some serious stuff and don't tell anyone. So next week's episode is definitely going to be, you know, getting past those moments. Because even in the beginning, I mean... You, it's not like, you know, I found out about the affair and then all we talked a couple minutes and then boom, kisses, hugs, love, blah, 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 blah. That didn't happen. There was still that resentment and that anger that had to come out and had to get cleaned out from both sides, not just my side. We, you know, a lot of you are probably thinking, well, you know, of course you were yelling at her and blah, 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 blah. But she had just as much to say uh, it, in it as I did. Because she was holding on to a lot of contempt and a lot of anger and a lot of resentment and just as such, just the same as me. To get to where we are now, you're gonna have to let that out. You have to go through it. You have to go through it to get to it. it, it if we can do it, and we were like, well, and I was super mega done with this marriage, and he was very whatever, whatever it I, seemed for years. <clears throat> I. What I'm telling you is, is if, if this is your situation and you think, you know, like, hey, no, I'm done. I'm totally not done. doing that. I'm not doing that. You'd be surprised um, because we were there. We were right there, right there looking out at the abyss, at the abyss out there and seeing that we were done. We were fantasizing about what our lives would be like if we were divorced. Yeah. Playing it on our heads, picturing how co-parenting would work. Like We were planning it out. I mean, we were all working on all the... the all the while trying things. to talk to each other and work through so the So the, the, the first few weeks of the conversation and stuff is not going to be, like I said, next episode we'll talk about that, but it's not going to be roses and and kisses and, and just hugs and we just hug it there out. There was a lot of tears. There were a lot of tears from both of us and and um, a lot of... A lot of... Realization, cleaning out realization but not even just between us and our marriage and our relationship but a lot of realizations of like i felt this way when you did this or when this happened because in my childhood xyz happened yeah. and and it's just we i mean we uncovered pandora's cleaning, box of yeah. what the hell was under we, there yeah we opened up we looked under the rock and under the rock was nothing nice and and the first a few weeks is going to, and like I said, we'll talk about it next week, but the first few weeks is going to going to be interesting, you know, to hear just because, you know, there was still a lot of anger and a lot of contempt and we had to get through that to get to where we are at this moment. And I'm completely happy with where we are now. Um, and so is she. Uh, so, you know, to salvage And if you it, see my face and I don't look like, um, guilty or depressed or, you know. Again. It's because he's forgiven me. And, and, and again, I've accepted that and, forgiveness. And again, we have talked about this extensively. So this isn't like surprise moment, telenovela kind of thing. This is, uh, this is, we, we openly discuss this with one another. We had numerous conversations. We've discussed this at length. We've had all the details hours have upon been given. hours, all the details of anything that ever happened about anything has been told to me and explained to me and, and to, to where I'm satisfied with it. So next week, we're going to be talking about some very interesting uh, conversations that we had, some difficult conversations. And I 
popping, jaw dropping conversations. <laughs> a lot of it. I sh we, the non relationship marriage counselors, Again, were just two people. Just two people. You know, though, talking. In retrospect, <laughs> like, we've been married for seven years out of the eight we've been together. And I say collectively between us, we have over 20 years of marriage experience. Unfortunately. Now with each other, <laughs> with other marriages, which we also learned um, a lot of things from. Yeah. And even now we can look back and realize reasons why those went the way they went. Um, yeah. So we're no experts here, but we do have a bit of experience in doing it the wrong way. And I think we figured out the key to doing it the right way. And, and we want to share that key with everybody. So I think that's the biggest takeaway from this is that we want to share the key there's that hope. we found. That there's, there's, hope. there's hope. And by no means are we telling anyone out there that if you pray or you have open and honest communication with someone that's mentally or physically abusing you, that's going to work out either. So, you know, those are whole different aspects and whole different things. So, but we're talking about our specific relationship uh, and, and saying that, you know, we know a lot of people out there that are holding back in their marriage or in the relationship. And a lot of people that probably aren't openly and honestly talking about their feelings. So, and again, like I said, we're not relationship experts, but we're talking from our experience. And so we will see you next, next week. week. So appreciate you watching. Appreciate everybody out there that's going to re rewatch this and, uh, Hopefully this this hopefully, helps you. Hopefully this helps in someone. some way. Hopefully this helps someone in some way or another. Then it'll be worth sharing and, our and again, dirty laundry. DM at your own risk. Don't be sending direct messages to people about something that you don't think we've talked about because we've talked about everything. But um, feel free to ask but us questions. But feel free to ask questions. And if you want to DM me and say something stupid, hey, I'll listen. I'll listen to you for a minute, and I'll probably say something stupid back. You know, if you know me well enough, you're probably gonna know that I'll do it. Um, and All right. enough. Hang on. All right. All right. Time to go. All right. Appreciate you watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs>